Okay, let me first thank the organizers for inviting me. I will talk about some applications in arithmetic branch theory of a technique based on non-standard analysis and ultra filters. Uh, I will start with, uh, I will start, I hope. Okay. Okay, this is a short summary, but the first part, I think most of you know pretty well the, the subject. In any case, I, I would like to go through the main uh, basic results. So arithmetic Ramsey theory essentially is that part of Ramsey theory that focuses on the existence of monochromatic patterns in the natural numbers that are defined by means of arithmetic operations. So a coloring in this context is of course a finite partition of some structure. And here we are interested in the integers. And the pattern is just a finite or an infinite uh, uh, set. And we talk about uh, monochromatic configurations, meaning that some specific pattern is included in one of the pieces of the partition. Okay, so these are basic examples of monochromatic patterns. So for instance, the so-called Schur triples that can be additive or multiplicative, and then also arithmetic progressions of some fixed length. And probably one of the first results in this area is Schur theorem that has been mentioned already. And it states that in any finite coloring of the natural numbers, one always find A, B, and A plus B of the same color. By the way, this result was used to prove that the last Fermat theorem fails for uh, finite fields of sufficiently large uh, cardinality. It took this combinatorial lemma. Another classic result is Van der Verden theorem stating that in any finite partition of the natural numbers, one always find monochromatic arithmetic progressions of any fixed length. One cannot have infinite arithmetic progressions, but one can have uh, finite but arbitrarily large arithmetic progressions in one color. Okay, these are all really classic results. So the typical problem, as I mentioned, is one fix some family of patterns. And the, the question is, can one find a monochromatic pattern in any given finite coloring? And if this is the case, the family is called partition regular. This is the terminology that is used. And it's called strongly partition regular if the same property can be iterated, meaning that if I start from one member of the family P and I partition that member into finitely many pieces, again, one of the pieces must belong to the family P. So for instance, the set, the basic example is our infinite sets. Of course, if I split an infinite set into finitely many pieces, one of the pieces must be infinite. Same thing, for instance, for sets of positive uh, asymptotic densities or for sets of the natural number that are large enough so that the series of reciprocals diverge and similar things. On the other hand, of course, two triples do not, are not strongly partition regular because they are just three elements and I can split them. Okay, so uh, starting from Schur theorem, uh, many generalizations have been found. So a natural question is to ask if I can find three different elements so that all partial sums from these elements belong to the same piece of any given partition. And this is in fact the case. And Folkman proved in the 70, 1970 that uh, this property holds for any given n. So this means that for any given n, and for any given finite partition of the natural numbers, I can always find n distinct numbers so that all possible sums of these elements, of distinct elements from this uh, n tuple, belong to the same piece of the partition. 
Okay, here is the, the statement, and this uh, notation Fs stands for the, the sums, the finite sums, so you want to take all possible sums of distinct elements. Now, a big jump as generalization of Schur theorem was done by Heinemann, who showed that this finite property can be extended to the infinite, and this is actually a, a big jump. And in fact, he proved that one can actually find an infinite sequence so that all possible sums taken from that infinite sequence of distinct element belong to the same piece of the partition. And this was a, is now one of the cornerstones of this area of research. And the original proof was combinatorial and complex, but uh, it was found pretty soon another different proof by using ultra filters, and that was the start of a whole area of research devoted to the uh, use of ultra filters in this area of Ramsey theory. And it was proved by combining the property of the space of ultra filter with a property that holds in general for. Uh, compact right topological semigroups. One consider a, an operation, a sort of pseudo sum operation between ultra filters. I will talk about this later. Now, another possible extension of this notion of partition regularity that comes naturally is the notion of partition regularity of equations, Diophantine equations. And the idea is that an equation is called partition regular if in any finite coloring one can find a monochromatic solution. So one can find elements in the same piece of the partition so that those elements are a root of the equation. And for instance, Schur theorem, the existence of A, B, A plus B of the same color is the same as to state the partition regularity of that linear equation. And for instance, three-term arithmetic progressions, the existence of three-term arithmetic progressions is just the same as to say that one find monochromatic solutions of this equation. And let me just mention for completeness that uh, it's a classical result that goes back to the 30s that one can characterize all linear Diophantine equations that are partition regular. And the condition is, really easy, so one has that some equation is partition regular if and only if some partial sum of the coefficients equals zero. So for instance, here you see Schur theorem, you sum the first and the third coefficient equals zero. In the second equation, the first, the second, and the third equals zero. But if not, if you are not able to find any partial sum equal to zero, the equation is not partition rule. Now the study of higher order uh, Diophantine equation, the partition regularity is not an easy task, but some results have been found recently. And in this area, also non-standard methods and ultra filters have been used. Let me just mention that in this area, there are still uh, simple but deep and difficult problems to be solved, starting from the problem of partition regularity of the Pythagorean equation. We still don't know if this is true or not. Another fundamental property is this one. It's really hard to combine additive and multiplicative structure to the point that we do not even know that if this pattern is partition regular, meaning is it true that in any finite partition of the natural numbers one have A, B, A plus B, A times B for some A and B. So this is a, a first step in combining uh, short triples in the additive and in the multiplicative sense. Let me just mention that many results now are known around the Pythagorean equations that seems to suggest that the result is true, but still one misses the, the, the final step, the probability is there. 
hardest one. You see any kind of equation that is a slight modification of the equation that has been proved to be partition regular or not partition regular. And it is, well, it has been found a solution for two colorings by using a computer assisted proof. But there are equations that are partition regular for two colorings, but not partition regular for finite colorings in general. So in this case, we don't know the answer yet. Okay, let me mention ultra filters. All of you know what they are. So let me stress that these are basic, trivial example of ultra filters, the principal ones. And the idea to go to a non standard setting is to make any ultra filter, even the non principal one, in a way, a sort of principal ultra filters. And this will, will help to deal with ultra filters. Let me show you that. And of course, you see, one can uh, state the property of ultra filters in terms of partition regularity, because this is one of the equivalent definition of ultra filters. If you have some finite partition of some member of the ultra filter, one of the pieces must belong to the ultra filter. And this is the, the, the basic property that tells that ultra filters and partition regularity problems are closely connected. So a family is partition regular, if and only if one can find an ultra filter that is a witness of this property. Witness means that the ultra filter has the property that any member of the ultra filter includes one of the patterns that we are talking about. So for instance, the partition regularity of uh, arithmetic progression of length 100 is witnessed by an ultra filter with the property that any member of the ultra filter contains, every member of the ultra filter contains a 100 term arithmetic progression and so forth. Okay, so now let me just recall quickly in one or two slides what non-standard analysis is about. Usually non-standard analysis is used in the context of the hyperreal line and about applications in analysis or measure theory, but here we are interested in applications in combinatorics. So instead of considering the, the hyperreal line, the non-standard version of the real numbers, we will consider the non-standard version of the natural numbers. Okay, so here are the two basic principles, just you are, of non-standard analysis. The idea is that any object of interest, any mathematical structure we are talking about has a so-called hyperextension or non-standard extension. And in model theoretic terms, this non-standard version is just an elementary extension of the original structure in a very strong sense, meaning that the language we are considering is the richest possible. So we put in the language any possible constant function and relation that we have on X. And we have this elementary extension property that is called in this context the, 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 the transfer principle. So as I mentioned before, in model theoretic terms, a hyperextension is an elementary extension of the complete structures. Complete structure, it means a structure with a, a language that contains a symbol for any possible relation and function on X. So for instance, when starting from the natural numbers, we will have an interpretation of any possible subset of the natural numbers, because we have an interpretation for any possible unary relation symbol and so forth. So as I said before, non-standard analysis usually focuses on the hyperreal line and on applications to analysis, but now here we are concerned about the applications to combinatorics, to, the, to a discrete setting, so we are considering that we are working with the hypernatural numbers that looks like any 
non-standard, say, models of piano arithmetics, but there is much, much more structure because of the rich language we have. Now, here is the point why it is, uh, can be useful to work in such a setting is the first observation is that the, 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 the model we are working with is sufficiently saturated. We have that in a way every alpha filter is a principal one. So if we take any ultra filter, one can find an element of the non-standard model so that the, in a way, sort of principal ultra filter generated by that element is the given ultra filter. And in model theoretic terms, this is essentially the one type of the element. Because the point here is that we are working with a complete language. So any subset is definable. We, we have that any subset has a symbol in the language. And so we can say that psi satisfy the property A or not. So again, by using saturation, one can show that any given ultra filter is indeed generated by some element. And actually, the point is that it is satisfied by plenty of such elements. There are many elements that will generate the same ultra filter. And in, in this sense, we will say that these elements are equivalent. They are indiscernible. And this is useful. And in fact, we, one can introduce this notion of equivalence. We say that two elements are equivalent if they satisfy the same one type, meaning that they generate the same ultra filter. So you cannot distinguish the, between these two elements. For any subset, you take the non-standard version of the subset. Both elements belong to star A or, sorry, this should be a complement. Or, no, no, it's, it's correct. Or both belongs to star A or do not belong to star A. So for instance, two equivalent elements must be even because we have a con concept of even because it means belongs to the start of the even numbers and so forth. Any property you have in mind, you have the non-standard counterpart. So we say that they are equivalent if they satisfy this condition. Now, there are properties of this uh, equivalence that one can prove. For instance, if two elements are equivalent and they are distinct, they must be at infinite distance. So one cannot have the psi and psi plus five at the same type. And if you have any function and from n to n, remember that this function has a symbol in the language. Two equivalent elements are mapped, uh, are, have images that are, again, equivalent. And then there is a third property which is, incorporates a property of ultra filter and says that if I have a function mapping the element psi into some element which is equivalent to psi, this can happen only if this image actually is precisely equal to psi. And for those of you who are a bit familiar with ultra filters, this precisely corresponds to this property. That is, that is a basic fact, but it takes some computation. It's not entirely trivial to say that the image of an ultra filter is the ultra filter itself, if and only if the function is almost everywhere the identity. Okay, now let's go to the non-standard characterization that we will use. So this notion of equivalence is interesting in this context because any equation is partition regular. One can prove this. Any equation is partition regular and a similar characterization is for family of patterns, of course. If and only if one can find solution to the non-standard version of the equation that are obtained by points which are one equivalent to the other. So for instance, true theorem Sure triples, monochromatic sure triples, are the same as to say that there are two elements, two distinct elements, non-standard elements, with the property that 
C, Z, Zeta, and the sums all are equivalent to each other. So to just to see how this method works, one example is this one, how one can prove that this equation is not partition regular, for instance. So the idea is that it's not possible to find alpha, beta, and gamma that are solution to this equation and that are equivalent. So here is the actual proof. So first of all, these are even numbers. They are equivalent. They have to be all even numbers or all odd numbers. And they cannot be all odd numbers. Otherwise, I have odd plus odd equal odd. So they are even. This means that I can factorize in this way with exponents that are not zero. Now, it is, as I mentioned before, if elements are equivalent, if I take any function, the image of these elements under that function must be equivalent as well. And if we take the function mapping a number to the exponent of two in the factorization, we have that these exponents must be equivalent. Okay, now we distinguish two cases. We can have that the exponent A is less than B or the other way around, that's the same. And we use this equation because these elements are assumed to satisfy the, the given equation. We factorize and we obtain that on the left side I have this and on the right side I have this. Now this number is odd by definition. This is odd because this is even and this is the square of an odd number. So these two numbers are precisely the exponent in two of the factorization of the same number. So 2a is the same as c. Now, by the hypothesis, c is equivalent to a. Now I have a function of a to a, which is equivalent to a. By the third property that I mentioned before, it was here, if the image of some element is equivalent to that element, then they must be the same. So since 2a is equivalent to a, they have to be equal. But this is not possible because a would be zero and this is a contradiction. The other case is similar. If a equals b, again, I make this factorization. Since a alpha one and beta one are odd, this number, the, the sums of these two squares is congruent to two mod four. So I can factor another two from this number. And I have that two C gamma one is actually equal to two to the two A plus one plus some odd number. And again, this is not possible because two A plus one, which is the same as C is equivalent to A. And the function two X plus one applied to A is equivalent to A means that these two numbers are uh, must be equal and this is a contradiction. Okay, now let's go to the title of the conference, tensor type. This is another really useful tool in this context. If I have a pair of, say, hypernatural numbers, a tensor pair is a pair that satisfies this kind of strange property. If I have, whenever this pair belongs to some extension of a set, I have some finite n on the left, so that n beta belongs to the set. Now, this has a model theoretic content. It, it has to, to do with cohairs of n independent pairs, but also has a, a set theoretic context. So this notion is equivalent in a way to this, to the typical product of ultra filters. So if I have a pair, I can consider the generated ultra filters on n cross n. I just take all sets A with the property that this alpha beta belongs to star of A. 
Now, when this pair is a tensor pair, if and only if the generated ultrafilter is precisely the tensor product of the two ultrafilters generated by alpha and by beta. Uh, in beta n, if you have a pair alpha beta, then you can say that the ultra filter generated by the pair is one of the many ultra filters that extends. Sorry, that oh, that extends the product of the two filters. I mean, in beta n cross n, the ultra filters here. If you start from an ultrafilter U of alpha and an ultrafilter U of beta, you have many possible ultrafilters on n times n projecting to U alpha and U beta. One special ultrafilter is the tensor product. And the pairs that generate such tensor products are precisely the tensor pairs as I defined before. And of course, by saturation, one can find plenty of such pairs belong with where components are belonging to any U equivalence class that we want. So let me just, as an example, go to the classic Ramsey theorem for pairs. And let me show you a, a proof by using this tensor pair. So, uh, so delta plus is just the upper diagonal, meaning that we identify this with all sets of two elements in N. Now we take any tensor pair. Of course, this tensor pair must belong to one of the colors because we have a partition. And now we prove that whenever a tensor pair belongs to something, one can construct the homogeneous set. And by definition of tensor pair, if alpha beta belongs to star of C, there must be some finite number so that this pair belongs to the star of C. Now, since beta and alpha are assumed to be equivalent, this belongs to star of C if and only if alpha belongs to this. Remember that this is a finite number, so this is a property I can express in the language. Now I take this collection of pairs so that the first component is greater than H1. H1n belongs to C, and the pair nm belongs to C. Now, we can easily see that the pair alpha beta belongs to the extension of this set. Why? Because alpha is certainly bigger than H1, is infinite. Because H1 alpha belongs to star C, here it is, and because alpha beta belongs to star C. So we have this property. Again, by using the tensor pair property, we have a finite H2 so that this pair belongs to the set. What does it mean? That H2 is bigger than H1. This property means that the pair H1, H2 belongs to C. And finally, this property means that H2 beta belongs to star C. But again, since beta and alpha are equivalent, this is the same as to say this. And now we simply iterate the process. So we produce H3 with this property and so forth. And we finally find a homogeneous set. So tensor pairs are exactly what is needed to produce infinite sequences. They are the right tool to jump from finite to infinite configurations. Yes, this, in fact, these pairs corresponds to taking a non-principal ultra filter and considering the tensor product U cross U. This is just a translation of a well-known proof by means of ultrafilters in this context. Okay, another example is Heinemann theorem. There are points that correspond to 
special ultra filters, and we call these points item points. What property they have is this one. If this element belongs to some star of A, then one can find a finite A belonging to the set itself, so that Ni plus A belongs to the set. One can see that idempotent points are indeed, they correspond to short sure triples with the additional property that alpha and beta are tensor. In fact, we have this characterization. This is idempotent if and only if there exists a tensor pair with this property. And again, this is equivalent to say that a tensor pair has this property. So this is idempotent if and all, let me tell you these two facts. This point is idempotent if and only if the corresponding ultra filter is idempotent in the usual sense of uh, algebra on the ultra filters, where one considers this operation. And this is precisely the tool that is used to prove Hyman's theorem. Now, as I mentioned, this operation, one can easily show that it's not commutative, it's just an associative operation. So one cannot expect this property to hold. It's not corresponding precisely to the sum of these non-standard numbers, but it does if one restricts to tensor pairs. And the existence of idempotent ultra filters and so to idempotent points is not trivial. It, it takes a result, a general result about compact, right, topological semigroups. And in fact, if we take this operation on the space of ultra filter, we get one example of compact house of right topological semigroups. So let me again go back to this Hyman's theorem. And these are two quotations that Hyman likes to state to say that the original proof is not really short and nice. And here is the non-standard proof. So you pick an idempotent element. So this idempotent must, of course, belong to one of the colors of the partition. And now we want to produce inside this color all the finite sums from a, an infinite sequence. So by the definition, since this belongs to C, there must be some finite X1 inside C with this property. And now by induction, if I have already defined a sequence up to N so that all possible finite sums belongs to the color and the infinite point plus these finite sums belongs to the non-standard extension. Then I can extend this property one step further. And I take all the shifts by these elements. And I have, because of this property, that this point belongs to all these shifts that are only finitely many. So the star map uh, commutes with finite intersections, which is the same as to say that the finite intersection of elements in an ultra filter belong to the ultra filter. And so we can pick, since this element belongs to this intersection, we can pick a finite element inside here so that Ni plus this element still belong to this. But this is exactly to say that we can add this X n plus one to the sequence so to produce again the property that we want, that all finite sums will belong to, to C. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, uh, combining sums and products is a difficult task in this context, but not only in general in number theory. And by using ultra filters, and the algebra on the space of ultra filters, Hyman was able to combine this additive and multiplicative property. But the point is that if you want the finite sums and the infinite sums, 
to be in, in monochromatic, you cannot ask for the two sequences to be the same. No, actually, this, this is wrong. I mean, one can also have finite sums and finite products in the same color. Sorry, this was a typo. The point is that the two sequences could be disjoint. One cannot have that sums and products are taken from the same sequence. And that's in fact the point. And as I mentioned, this is one of the open problems in this area. And again, as you see, there are partial results that seems to suggest that this is the case, but still we are not there. This was the beginning of, again with a computer assisted proof. Then some recent results by Moreira. We have A, A plus B, A times B. We can have A, B, C, A plus B, A times C. We can have A, A plus B, A plus B plus A times B. We can have A, B, A plus B plus A times B. And these results have been announced um, recently, the Ultramath conference in Pisa for two colorings, similar as in uh, Pythagorean equation. The, 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 the whole problem is still open. Okay, so for the final part of this talk, I want to mention a, a, a new result about exponential triples. So sums products, next step is exponentials. And the first result was that in any two partition, one can find a monochromatic configuration of this kind. Recently, Sasra Budre proved a strong result where this property was generalized to any finite coloring. And also, he found that one can find monochromatic configurations taken from finite sequences, from which we can take exponential and multiplicative configurations. So this proof is quite long. The point is that it uses the, the typical basic tools of combinatorics, like applications of Van der Verden theorem, considering these topological spaces to find which is the spaces of colorings, and taking subsequences which converge and applying several other uh, combinatorial things. And indeed, the algebra of ultrafilters cannot be applied directly here. We do not have anything like Alice Lemma saying that some we that we have idempotent ultrafilters with respect to this operation simply because the operation of exponentiation is not associative. So we do not have the tools. On the other hand, one can use an important class of ultrafilters here that are called minimal idempotents. They are not only idempotent, but some stronger property to prove the existence of infinite increasing sequence. So that all, say, meaningful exponential patterns that uh, or the, uh, the one can construct starting from that sequence are monochromatic. So we'll, more, we'll be more precise on this in the next slides. So recall that in Heinemann's theorem, one take all possible finite sums from an infinite increasing sequence. And that was the jump from Folkman theorem of finite sequences to a single infinite sequence. Now we want to define something similar to this set of finite sums with respect to an exponentiation. But of course, we need to be careful because the operation is not, not only not commutative, but is not even associative, so we need to pay attention. So this is a reasonable possibility. If I have an increasing sequence, I start with the first element. If I take two elements, I take the second and the second raised to the first one, because we need to preserve some order in this exponentiation. If I take three elements, I can consider all these exponentiation. 
So for instance, here I take A3 to the power A2 and take this to the power A1, or this one, A3 to the power A1 to the power A2, and so forth. These are all reasonable possible exponentiation with three elements. We observe that exponents here of A3 are all products of members of the previous stages multiplied. I can add one in case, I mean, I don't have any exponent to consider. So this seems a natural choice that we take all exponentiation a1 to an to be the powers of an with uh, exponents that are products taken from previous steps. And the finite exponentiation is the union of such. So the, 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 the base could be a, a n, but also all other elements. And then we go to the infinity and take all the union of all these finite exponentiations. One can show that inside this set, one have all possible towers of exponentiations. And we have some little freedom in the sense that n and m must be in decreasing order, but the rest of the exponents can be taken, of course, less than m, but can be taken not necessarily in decreasing order, can be taken equal. We have some freedom here that in general we don't have in theorems like Feynman's theorem. So about exponentiation, uh, Sassarabude proved result about finite patterns that also mix a multiplicative structure, but about exponentiations, this is what he got, a sort of like Folkman's theorem, in any finite coloring, one find for any n, n numbers, so the all finite exponentiation are monochromatic. And the result that we got is to extend this from finite sequence to infinite sequence. So we have that for any finite <coughs> coloring of the uh, natural numbers, there exists an infinite sequence so that all possible exponentiations are monochromatic. So as I mentioned, this is a, in a similar way as Heinemann's theorem generalized Folkman's theorem. Now, the proof of this general case uses the central set theorem, which is an advanced tool in the algebra of ultrafilters. Central sets are the member, can be characterized as the members of minimal idempotent ultrafilters. <clears throat> the proof takes some computations, non trivial computations, but I want to stress here the fact that the original idea of dealing with these configurations by using ultra filter was suggested by a non-standard viewpoint with tensor pairs. So let me just explain a, a particular case of this result that can be proved shortly. So we will prove this result, which is actually more general than an exponential triple, because if I have a monochromatic configuration of this form, if I take two to the power of these elements, I obtain a com an exponential configuration. So in other words, if I have a finite coloring and I want to find an exponential configuration, I change the, the coloring by introducing these colors. By the previous result, I have a monochromatic triple of this form, which means that when I take two to the X, two to the Y, and two to this number, they will belong to the same CI. And you see that this A, B, and C form an exponential triple. <clears throat> now, I, uh, how much time do I have? Now there is an ultra filter proof that it's a short one, but I will skip it because I want to stress on the uh, tensor pair idea. 
So let me mention this theorem. This is a well-known theorem is in the area. It's just Van der Verden theorem saying that I have an arithmetic progression of length n for any n of, of any L. And this is a, an improvement that is usually used where also the common distance belong to the same piece of the partition. This is a well-known result. And by using, let me skip this. This is the ultra filter proof. If someone is interested, I will come back on this later. You see, it's just a eight line proof in a slide. So let me mention this idea of I, uh, taking tensor pairs. A convenient way of considering tensor pairs, producing tensor pairs, is to work, since we, here we are in a, with a set theoretic audience, I can take a, a, an elementary em, embedding of the universe into itself by dropping the foundation axiom. If I work in such a context, this map can be iterated. And if I take two numbers inside star of n, a star b is always a tensor pair. So that's a convenient way of dealing with tensor pairs. And here is the proof. I take two numbers, alpha and delta, that have this property. This directly follows from the theorem we saw before. Because by saying that in any finite coloring, I find an arithmetic progression in the same color is the same as to say I can find elements all equivalent which form an arithmetic progression. By putting stars, this property that holds for all finite L can be extended to this one. So it's just a transfer. I have for all L in N, I have this property. I can transfer to, for all gamma in star N, I have this property about the star alpha and star delta elements. And then I take these two elements, two to the alpha times star delta, which of course correspond to some precise ultra filters. I take the star of this, which is equivalent to the previous element. This is easily proved the star of something is equivalent to the starting element. And then this is A, this is the second element. And if I take two to this times this, by a simple computation, I get that this is the exponent of two on the left. But this is by this property equivalent to star of A. So I can replace by equivalence, this exponent by this. Now, this can be done with pairs. I can replace one component of a pair with another equivalent one, provided the pair is tensor. Otherwise, I cannot do it. And so at the end, I get this monochromatic configuration, A star A and two R star A. And this is the same as to say that this configuration is monochromatic. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, is a monochromatic graph of both or x, y, x plus y, x times y, five fields. Yes. It is not. Uh, <laughs> yes, but you see, we don't have the, the field property here. It's different. If you're working with the integers, you yeah. cannot use. And in fact, it was proved that property in the case of the rational numbers. So that's plausible because it is filled, but in the context of natural numbers is, oh, well, okay, some commercial just in case.
not directly. You, you know what, what's the problem here is if these two elements formed a tensor pair, then we could produce the infinite sequence. But you see these two elements, you put a star here, but the problem is that you should put a double star to make it tensor because this is in the, say in the first level, this is in the second level. And if you want to get a, a tensor pair, this should be this joint in a way from this, should be from the third level on. There is a mixture here between this star delta and this star alpha. So this pair A times A, in this case, do not form a tensor pair. So you cannot directly use the, you, you can produce some infinite sequence, but it's a strange triple. You have A, B, C, so that A, B is tensor, B, C is tensor, but B is in between, so it's, it's strange. Yep. Yeah.